Okay, so you think you know what makes a company great, right? Yeah, strong leadership, innovation. Maybe a bit of luck. Sure. Well, get this. What if I told you some of those are like total red herrings? Mm. Really? Yeah, we did a deep dive into Jim Collins' Good to Great, and let me tell you, it's way more interesting than you might think. We're not talking about, like, the usual Silicon Valley superstars here. Right, so what kind of companies are we talking about? Think, like, Circuit City, Walgreens, not exactly the first names that come to mind, right? Hmm, not really. But here's the thing, they absolutely dominated their markets, and that's what makes Collins' work so fascinating. So it's not just about being in the sexy industry of the moment? Nope. He wasn't just anecdotally looking at successful companies. He was looking for businesses that were statistically average for years, and then, bam, they just skyrocketed to the top. And not just a flash in the pan, right? They stayed there. Oh, absolutely. And get this, they often outperformed even giants like Coca-Cola over the long haul. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. How did they do it? Well, that's the million-dollar question. And it wasn't just luck, that's for sure. One of the biggest things Collins found was this consistent pattern of a very specific type of leadership. He calls them level five leaders. Level five. Sounds kind of mysterious. Right. And here's the thing. They weren't your typical charismatic in-your-face CEOs. Really? Yeah. I think more like uh, humble architects. They were all about building an enduringly great company, not their own egos. Okay. So less Steve Jobs, more. Yeah. Warren Buffett, maybe? Yeah, exactly. But how do you even spot a level five leader in the wild, right? It's not like it's a job requirement you put on LinkedIn. That's true. So what are some of the telltale signs? Well, one thing Collins talks about is that they're often described as like self-effacing, even shy. Huh, interesting. Not what you'd expect. I know, right? Ah. But they're also incredibly ambitious. Okay, so which is it? Ambitious or shy? Both. But here's the key. Their ambition is directed towards the company's success, not their own personal gain. Like, they're driven, but in a way that empowers everyone around them. And probably big on building the right team. Oh, absolutely. They were obsessed with getting the right people on the bus, so to speak, even if it meant making tough decisions early on. So it's not just about talent for them. It's about fit, the right people in the right seats. Exactly. They understood that talent alone isn't enough. It's about finding people who align with the company's values and goals, people who can help build something truly great. And speaking of building something great, good to great doesn't shy away from the tough stuff either. One of the concepts that really hit me was this idea of the Stockdale Paradox. The what paradox? Stockdale Paradox. Have you heard of that? Rings a bell, but refresh my memory. It's this idea of like, Confronting reality head on, but at the same time, maintaining this unwavering faith that you'll ultimately achieve your goal. Oh, right, right. I get it. Sounds easier said than done, though. Totally. So how does that actually play out in a real world business setting? Like, what does that look like in action? It's about having the guts to see the brutal facts, as Collins puts it, without letting those facts paralyze you. Okay, I like that. Brutal facts. So it's not about sugarcoating things or pretending everything's rosy. No way. Like, think about the banking industry back when everything was getting deregulated. Talk about massive upheaval. Yeah, that was a wild time. So how does the Stockdale paradox fit into that? Well, Wells Fargo is the perfect example. They knew huge changes were coming. But instead of panicking, they got laser focused on what they could actually control. Think it was. Becoming ruthlessly efficient, <sighs> like eliminating every single bit of waste they could find. Okay, when you say eliminating waste, give me some specifics. What were they actually doing? I'm talking about making tough choices, the kind of choices a lot of companies wouldn't even consider. They got rid of all those executive perks, you know, fancy dining rooms, corporate jets, the whole nine yards. No more private jets for the executives. That's serious. They even did away with free coffee in the executive suite. Whoa, no free coffee. They weren't messing around. Nope. And get this, the CEO at the time, Carl Reichart, he actually froze executive salaries for two years. Wow, two years. Even though the company was doing well. Even though they were doing well. He wanted to send a clear message, we're all in this together. We're going to be lean, we're going to be disciplined, and that's how we're going to weather this storm. Man, talk about walking the talk. That's leadership. But it, it can't just be about cutting costs, right? No, definitely not. There has to be a bigger picture, a strategy for success, some kind of North Star. You got it. And that's where I imagine the hedgehog concept comes in. Although I have to say, that's always been one of those terms that sounds a little, I don't know, 
buzzwordy to me. And that's kind of the point, right? It's not about <laughs> like this one big heroic thing you do and then bam, you're great. Yeah. It's more about consistency. So more like a marathon than a sprint. Exactly. It's yeah. like this uh, this big heavy flywheel, you know. Okay, I'm picturing it. Go on. At first, it takes like a ton of effort just to get it to budge, right? Yeah, I can imagine. But each push, each little bit of progress, it adds a bit more momentum. Okay, so each push might be small, but it all adds up over time. Right. And eventually that wheel is spinning so fast, it's almost like effortless. But that effortless spin is actually the result of all that consistent effort you put in at the beginning. Exactly. You got it. So how does that translate to like a real world company, especially in today's world? Things move so fast now. How do you even maintain that kind of focus? It's about building that discipline into the culture, you know? Okay, but what does that actually look like? Are we talking about like rigid rules, strict processes? Because that doesn't sound very inspiring. No, no, not at all. It's not about being stifling. It's about making sure everyone's on the same page, that they understand the hedgehog concept, what you're trying to be the best at and they're empowered to make decisions within that framework. So it's like guardrails, not handcuffs. You've got the freedom to move, to be creative, but you're all moving in the same direction. Right, it's like, um, you know, a jazz band. Love a good jazz analogy, go on. Everyone knows the key, the tempo, the basic structure, but within that, there's a lot of room to play, to improvise. But it only works because of that underlying structure. Without it, it would just be noise. Exactly. And it's the same with a company. You need that discipline to create the space for true innovation to happen. So give me an example. What's a company that really nailed this balance? Abbott Laboratories is a great example. The pharmaceutical company. Yep, that's the one. They went from being like a pretty average pharmaceutical company to being a leader in uh, cost-effective healthcare products. Okay, so how'd they do it? Well, they were all about financial discipline, like keeping their administrative costs super low, holding people accountable for hitting their objectives, that kind of thing. Sounds pretty by the book so far. Yeah, but here's the thing. They didn't stifle creativity. In fact, they found that having that financial discipline actually freed their people up to be more creative. Wait, really? How does that work? Well, because they weren't wasting time and resources on things that didn't matter, they could focus more on developing new products, exploring new markets, you know, really innovating. They could jam, but they stayed in their lane, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down. So discipline actually fuel legal ease creativity. In a way, yeah. Think of it like a sculptor with a block of marble, I'm right? with you. They've got their tools, their techniques, that's their discipline. And that's what allows them to shape that raw material into something beautiful and unique. I like that. It's the same with business. You need that discipline to create the space for something truly innovative to emerge. This is really making me rethink like my whole approach to, well, pretty much everything, but we'd be doing a disservice if we didn't talk about the big T technology. Mm. It's hard to imagine any company these days becoming truly great without embracing, you know, new tech, innovation, all that. So where does that fit into the good to great philosophy? That's actually one of the most interesting parts. Collins found that the companies that made that leap from good to great, they weren't necessarily the first ones to jump on every new technology trend. Wait, seriously, I always thought being first to market, being on the cutting edge was like the key, especially these days. It's a common misconception. See, technology, it's a tool, an amplifier. Okay, I like that, an amplifier. But it's not the source of greatness in and of itself. What these companies understood was that you got to first be crystal clear on your hedgehog concept, right? What, you're what you can be the best in the world at thing. Exactly. And then, and only then, can you strategically use technology to like amplify those strengths, to accelerate that flywheel we were talking about. So it's not about being the first one with the shiny new toy. It's about being the best at using the right tool for the job at the right time. Exactly. You got it. So give me an example. Take Walgreens, for example. Hmm. Back in the early 80s, way before the internet, before e-commerce, they invested heavily in this technology system called Intercom. Intercom? What did that do? It basically electronically linked up all their stores, allowed them to share customer data in real time. So no matter which Walgreens you walked into, they had your prescription history, your preferences, all that. Yep. Like having your own personal pharmacy, no matter where you were. Genius. And they were doing this way back in the 80s. That's incredible foresight. It wasn't about trying to be techie, though. It was about their hedgehog concept. Which was all about being the most convenient drugstore. Bingo. They saw how this technology could make their customers' lives easier, more convenient. 
And by the time the internet came along, they were already miles ahead of the game. Exactly. Uh. Because they built that foundation. Yeah. They didn't have to scramble to figure out e-commerce like some of their competitors. They just plugged it into their existing system. Leverage. Exactly. So the takeaway here is don't get so caught up in chasing the latest tech that you lose sight of what makes you truly great. Technology is a tool, it's an enabler, but it's not the magic bullet. Couldn't have said it better myself. This has been like eye-opening, seriously. But before we wrap up, I gotta ask, we've been talking about discipline, efficiency, turning that flywheel, all that makes sense, but what about the human side of things? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. It's a common misconception, thinking it's gotta be all about like systems and processes. So it's not just about creating a company full of robots, programmed for success. No way. Yeah. The people in these companies, they weren't just going through the motions. They were passionate, driven. So it was more than just a job to them. Absolutely. Remember the hedgehog concept. It's not just about finding something you can be the best at. It's got to be something you love doing, something you're passionate about. When you hit that sweet spot, that's when things really take off. Right. Like, it's got to be more than just a paycheck. You got to have that fire in your belly. Exactly. And it's not just about individual passion either. The companies that really killed it, they created this culture where everyone felt connected to that purpose, you know? Like they were all part of something bigger than themselves. Yes. They were building something meaningful, something they could be proud of. That's inspiring, but honestly, it also feels kind of daunting. Like, how do you actually create that? It's definitely a challenge. Right. But that's what good to great is all about, right? It's not about luck or being in the right place at the right time. It's about making choices, being disciplined, finding your hedgehog, and just going for it. One step at a time, turning that flywheel. This has been amazing. So for everyone listening, here's your takeaway. Find what you can be the best at, build your A-team, and get to work. You might just surprise yourself. <laughs> Until next time.